Hello. Hello. Welcome to Booker Mormon or Bust. Our names are Tracy, Levi, and Renee, and Mason should be shortly. This is Ammon. <laughs> and we are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. We are also members of the Zion or Bust online community. Our goal with this series is to further prepare ourselves by casting off the chains of condemnation placed upon us through neglecting the Book of Mormon as described in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 84. And this condemnation rests upon the children of Zion, even all, and they shall remain under this condemnation until they repent and remember the new covenant, even the Book of Mormon and the former commandments which I have given them, not only to say, but to do according to that which I have written. President Nelson taught the Book of Mormon is our latter day survival guide. Therefore, we invite you to join with us in using the Book of Mormon as your survival guide in these latter days as we prepare ourselves for the redemption of Zion. Please share your thoughts, ex experiences, good reports, and questions in the chat. And without further ado, let's dive in to the Book of Mormon. And Renee, you are first up. Woohoo! All right. I, ouch. <laughs> I. Sure hope you're not too sick of going over put on my strength, O Zion, by now, because we're going to do it again. <laughs> um, this is just, it's how I study, um, especially big topics. I'll go over it and over it and over it from slightly different angles. And then by the end, it kind of comes together for me. So let's do it again with a slight addition. <laughs> Third Nephi, 2036. Awake, awake again, and put on thy strength, O Zion. And then from Moroni 1031, and awake and arise from the dust, O Jerusalem, yea, and put on thy beautiful garments, O daughter of Zion, that the covenants of the eternal Father, which he hath made unto thee, O house of Israel, may be fulfilled. So this time, I've divided these verses up into three steps. Number one is wake up. <laughs> Number two, put on thy strength. Number three, that the covenants made into the house of Israel may be fulfilled. So for step one, wake up, I just pulled in three quotes. First one's from Orson Pratt. The Latter-day Saints are not in darkness. They are the children of light. Although many of us will actually be asleep. We shall have to wake up and trim our lamps or we shall not be prepared to enter in. For we shall all slumber and sleep in that day, and some will have gone to sleep from which they will not awake until they awake up in darkness without any oil in their lamps. President Brigham Young, when I think upon this subject, I want the tongues of seven thunders to wake up the people. Can the fathers be saved without us? No. Can we be saved without them? No. And if we do not wake up, and cease to long after the things of this earth, we will find that we as individuals will go down to hell, although the Lord will preserve a people unto himself. Heber C. Kimball, take the boys here, the sons of our brethren and sisters, and you may cut them into inch pieces and they will not forsake this cause, but they will defend it to the last. Some of them may be rough and perhaps some of them do not pray much, but send them into the vineyard, and then you will see them shew forth the power that is in them. At present, the prophet Joseph's boys lay apparently in a state of slumber. Everything seems to be perfectly calm with them. But by and by, God will wake them up, and they will roar like the thunders of Mount Sinai. Step two is put on thy strength, O Zion, which we have discussed a lot is to put on the authority of the priesthood and return to that power in the priesthood, which we had lost. We do this by receiving ordinance of the gospel, by making understanding and keeping our covenants with God and each other, and then by helping others do the same. In other words, we could say that step two is the spiritual gathering of Israel. First, we allow ourselves to be gathered by exercising faith unto repentance and receiving the ordinances of the gospel. Then we help gather others into the covenant, into the house of Israel. In gospel principles, it says the Israelites are to be gathered spiritually first and then physically. They are gathered spiritually as they join the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 
and make and keep sacred covenants. This spiritual gathering began during the time of the prophet Joseph Smith and continues today all over the world. Converts to the church are Israelites either by blood or adoption. They belong to the family of Abraham and Jacob. Uh, I have a little chain. These are all from President Nelson. He says, a necessary prelude to the second coming is the long-awaited gathering of scattered Israel. Anytime you do anything that helps anyone on either side of the veil take a step toward making covenants with God and receiving their essential baptismal and temple ordinances, you are helping to gather Israel. It's as simple as that. And this is my words. We could also say, anytime you do anything that helps anyone on either side of the veil, take a step toward making covenants with God and receiving their essential ordinances, you are helping Zion awake and put on her strength, which is priesthood power and authority. Back to President Nelson. My dear young brothers and sisters, these surely are the latter days, and the Lord is hastening his work to gather Israel. That gathering is the most important thing taking place on earth today. Nothing else compares in magnitude. Nothing else compares in importance. Nothing else compares in majesty. Temples are a vital part of the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ in its fullness. Ordinances of the temple fill our lives with power and strength available in no other way. We thank God for those blessings. The Lord wants you to understand with great clarity exactly what you are making covenants to do. He is the one who wants you to experience fully his sacred ordinances. He wants you to comprehend your privileges, promises, and responsibilities. He wants you to have spiritual insights and awakenings you've never had before. So this brings us to step three. That the covenants of the eternal father, which he hath made unto thee, O house of Israel, may be fulfilled. In other words, we could say step three is the physical gathering of Israel. If we go back to the, excuse me, we go back to the gospel principles manual. It says the Israelites are to be gathered spiritually first and then physically. The physical gathering of Israel means that the covenant people will be gathered home to the lands of their inheritance and shall be established in all their lands of promise. So that's the covenants of the eternal father being fulfilled. But this physical gathering can't and won't happen all at once. Who are the first people God will gather physically together to redeem Zion? The strength of his house, his warriors, the remnant of Jacob, the army of Israel. Doctrine and Covenants 101, 55 through 58 says, And the Lord of the vineyard said unto one of his servants, Joseph Smith, Go and gather together the residue of my servants and take all the strength of mine house, which are my warriors, my young men, and they that are of middle age, and also all my servants, who are the strength of mine house save only those whom I have appointed to tarry. And go ye straightway into the land of my vineyard and redeem my vineyard, for it is mine. I have bought it with money. Therefore, get ye straightway into my land, break down the walls of mine enemies, throw down their tower, and scatter their watchmen. And inasmuch as they gather together against you, avenge me of my enemies, that by and by I may come with the residue of mine house and possess the land. So once the Lord has a people who have exercised faith, uh, faith is the brother of Jared, who have put on the strength of the priesthood and returned to the power that the saints had lost, who have lived up to their privileges and rent the veil of unbelief, then God, through his servant Joseph Smith, will gather together the strength of his house to go and redeem Zion by power. What power? God's power. Priesthood power. Doctrine and Covenants 105, starting in verse 23. And let all my people who dwell in the regions round about be very faithful and prayerful and humble before me. In this way, you may find favor in the eyes of the people until the army of Israel becomes very great. And I will soften the hearts of the people as I did the heart of Pharaoh from time to time until my servant Joseph Smith Jr. and my elders whom I have appointed 
shall have time to gather up the strength of mine house. And I will hold the armies of Israel guiltless in taking possession of their own lands, which they have previously purchased with their monies, and of throwing down the towers of mine enemies that may be built upon that may be upon them, and scattering their watchmen and avenging me of mine enemies unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. But first, let my army become very great, and let it become sanctified before me. Again, how are we sanctified? By the Spirit as we exercise faith unto repentance and keep our covenants. So let it be sanctified before me, that it may become fair as the sun and clear as the moon, and that her banners may be terrible unto all nations, that the kingdoms of this world may be constrained to acknowledge that the kingdom of Zion is in very deed the kingdom of our God and his Christ. Therefore, let us become subject unto her laws. There has been a day of calling, But the time has come for a day of choosing, and let those be chosen that are worthy. And it shall be manifest unto my servant by the voice of the Spirit, those that are chosen, and they shall be sanctified. And inasmuch as they follow the counsel which they receive, they shall have power after many days to accomplish all things pertaining to Zion. 1 Nephi 14, 12 and 14 again. I beheld the church of the Lamb of God, and its numbers were few. And the power of the Lamb of God descended upon the saints of the church of the Lamb and upon the covenant people of the Lord who were scattered upon the face of the earth. And they were armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. President Boyd K. Packer said, The Book of Mormon makes it clear that we will never dominate by numbers, but we have the power of the priesthood. Joel 2.11, and the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? 3 Nephi 21, starting in verse 12, and my people who are a remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles, yea, in the midst of them as a lion among the beasts of the forest as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who, if he go through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. Their hands shall be lifted up upon their adversaries, and all their enemies shall be cut off. Yea, woe be unto the Gentiles, except they repent. For it shall come to pass, saith the Father, that at that day, whosoever will not repent and come unto my beloved Son, them will I cut off from among my people, O house of Israel. And I will execute vengeance and fury upon them, even as upon the heathen, such as they have not heard. But if they, the Gentiles, will repent and hearken unto my words and harden not their hearts, I will establish my church among them. And they shall come into the covenant and be numbered among this, the remnant of Jacob, unto whom I have given this land for their inheritance. And they shall assist my people, the remnant of Jacob, and also as many of the house of Israel as shall come, that they may build a city which shall be called the New Jerusalem. And then they shall assist my people, that they may be gathered in, who are scattered upon all the face of the land, in unto the New Jerusalem. So the remnant of Jacob is gathered first, so that more gathering can occur. More and more people can be gathered in um, over time. Orson F. Whitney, Whitney said, And it shall be said among the wicked, Let us not go up to battle against Zion, for the inhabitants of Zion are terrible. Terrible for what? For bayonets? For cannon? For the sword? No. Terrible for righteousness. And I'm going to end on another scripture chain from, from all from President Nelson. Begin now to learn and experience what it means to be armed with priesthood power. To each of you who has made temple covenants, I plead with you to seek prayerfully and consistently to understand temple covenants and ordinances. Spiritual doors will open. You will learn how to part the veil between heaven and earth, how to ask for God's angels to attend you, and how to better receive direction from heaven. The future is bright for God's covenant-keeping people. The Lord will increasingly call upon his servants who worthily hold the priesthood to bless, comfort, and strengthen mankind and to help prepare the world and its people 
for his second coming. In coming days, we will see the greatest manifestations of the Savior's power that the world has ever seen. Between now and the time he returns with power and great glory, he will bestow countless privileges, blessings, and miracles upon the faithful. And then I'll wrap it up with where we started. Awake, awake again, and put on thy strength, O Zion. Awake and arise from the dust, O Jerusalem. Yea, and put on thy beautiful garments, O daughter of Zion, that the covenants of the eternal Father, which he hath made unto thee, O house of Israel, may be fulfilled. And that ends my thought. Amen. <laughs> For risk of sounding redundant. That was powerful. <laughs> no, that was really good. Like always. Um, at the very end, I, the quote from President Nelson, where it says, the greatest manifestations of the Savior's power that the world has ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, what came to mind as you're going through this is like, we're, we're encouraged and counseled to learn how to, you know, utilize this power. And so those greatest manifestations will be coming from the Savior's power, but they'll pro be probably be coming through that remnant. It's not just the Savior doing everything. He's doing it through his servants. And that's just one thing. I mean, probably everybody already knows that, but that's just one thing like in my mind, instead of like the Savior coming down and doing it, it's like, okay, now I can see this host of people performing these greatest manifestations, healing the sick, you know, um, working hand in hand with angels and things of that nature. And that's just a really cool picture in my head of, of seeing that happen. And the power manifested through Joseph Smith too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I wrote down a few things as you're reading. Um, so first I, I thought it was interesting that even people who don't know the scriptures use the term asleep, <laughs> you know, if, uh, you know, if you don't see what's going on in the world world around you, you must be asleep. So it's, it's it's very fitting, and you know, prophetic. I would say that that that's just such a good term to use. Um, and I also, you know, I, I've heard the quote lots of times before, but where there are people who, you know, maybe they're not so good at praying, but you put them in the vineyard, and, and you know, see them roar basically. But oh. You know, if you notice, it doesn't say that they will stay in that state, right? Um, people can't expect to be these great people and still be bad at praying and and keeping the commandments, and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, that, that quote about how, uh, nothing compares in importance to the gathering. You know, that one's that always so good to hear. And, you know, I always have to hold up my life to that and say, do my actions show that I believe that? Or does it merely hold importance in my thoughts occasionally and I don't do anything about it? You know, that's, that's a good standard to, you know, in all my preparation, I have to remember that that's nothing else is more important. And, you know, am I making work more important? Am I making my, um, you know, extra, extra, extra preparation. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying I'm all the way prepared, but, um, you know, once I have a year of food storage, do I, I, I do keep going and, and get more, but am I so focused on that, that I don't do any um, help for others in gathering? And uh, I, I also loved how you showed that the greatness of the army is in its power, not in its numbers. Because that almost seems contradictory when when you very first said it, and so I, I love the follow up explanation. Um, and the uh, the the last thing I put, um, I'd forget which quote. It was when we were talking about the just there at the end with President Nelson. The Lord will increasingly call upon His servants who are worthy to bless and comfort and strengthen. Um, so again, looking for opportunities without keeping our heads down in our own lives only. Um, but, you know, lately I've been noticing a huge difference when I, when I feel like I'm not doing that well. Um, fasting has actually really been a big help. You know, I, 
Um, I've been trying, you know, I'm not doing this every week <laughs> like some people, um, but I, I set a goal to fast two times a month instead of one time. And it seems like by the time I come around to the third week or the first week, it's like, oh, I feel like my spirituality has been waning a little bit. And then I do the fast. And then afterwards, I feel so much better about how I'm doing and and the spirit's a lot stronger. So definitely something I recommend. Um, I got through all my notes, but <laughs> you did a really good job. Thank you. I, I liked how you laid it all out so nicely and, and how well it's going to complement mine and Tracy's um insights i didn't i haven't looked at masons yet so <laughs> what they're going to complement each other <laughs> <Funny So weird>. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you no i really i really appreciated your thoughts as well levi all right well should we move on to me or did do either we have more to add i don't have any more to add Hi Mason. Hi. Hi Mason. Hi. I'm so sorry for being late. Sorry. Can you sloppy? No problem. <laughs> you're you're okay. You're you're not the first one to break dress code. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know if we really have one, but <laughs> there's formalities. On well, that. to be honest, I always feel awkward, a little awkward. I mean, you can't tell if you know Renee and I were to wear a dress or a skirt or anything because you don't see the bottoms, you only see the tops. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, only in certain circumstances is it lucky. <laughs> <laughs> we're not like you know the general authority um women with suit coats, so blazers. Like <laughs> <laughs> power. Actually, I don't Blazers. even own anything like that. Renee probably does, but I don't. I yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not not. I have like I have one. Oh. I have one. Okay. <laughs> Just never know. <laughs> you never know. It's true. <laughs> I have to be Donald Trump or something. <laughs> All right. Okay. Right, Levi, Levi's. Yeah. Okay. So for mine, I'm going to start out in first Nephi 22. Well, actually, I'm going to stay it there. <laughs> um, but in verse uh, 17, it says, Wherefore, he will preserve the righteous by his power, even if it so be that the fullness of his wrath must come. And the righteous be preserved, even unto the destruction of their enemies by fire. Wherefore, the righteous need not fear, for thus saith the prophet, they shall be saved, even if it so be as by fire. So this one um, was isn't the main focus of the thought, but it does tie in, and, and it's a little bit later verses. But I also, this thought that... Um, I'm going to read from the manual here, just remind me also of Micah's fireside on Sunday, which was phenomenal. But anyway, so student manual, the righteous need not fear. While Nephi recorded that the righteous need not fear because the Lord's protective hand will be over them during the calamities of the last days, the wicked have no promise of protection from these events. Elder Bruce R. McConkie taught, we do not say that all the saints will be spared and saved from the coming day of desolation. But we do say there is no promise of safety and no promise of security except for those who love the Lord and who are seeking to do all that he commands. Um, in verse 24, the same chapter of Nephi, the time cometh speedily that the righteous meet must be led up as calves of the stall and the Holy One of Israel must reign in dominion and might and power and great glory. So in the student manual for calves of the stall, there are a couple points here. President Joseph Fielding Smith taught that children who will be raised during the millennium shall grow up as calves of the stall unto righteousness. That is without sin or the temptations which are so prevalent today. Contemplate the difference between a calf that is raised out on the range or in the mountains and one that is raised in a barn. The calf on the range is subject to all the forces of nature, inclement weather, predatory animals, and occasional scarcity of food and water. 
On the other hand, the calf raised in the barn or in a stall is protected from poor weather and predatory animals. Likewise, food and water are regularly provided. Nephi taught that the time cometh speedily that the righteous must be led up as calves of the stall. One commentator said, those who are left after the judgment of the second coming will be able to raise up their children as calves are raised in a stall. The calf is protected from the elements and his environment is controlled. The children in the millennium will similarly grow up without sin unto salvation. The celestial element will be removed, and with Satan being bound, the environment will be more controlled. Um, so, you know, when I was reading that, my first thought was, I'm so looking forward to that for my children. I, I would happily pay the price of hard times to give them good times. On the other hand, a part of me, is, at least used to be this way, I used to think, how is that fair? <laughs> Why do some get to have a free pass without sin or temptation? How is that even a test? You know, back to the odds are you might be exalted. Anyway, um, but we're going to answer that question. So let's keep reading. So in verse 26 of First Nephi 22, and because of the righteous of his people, Satan has no power. Wherefore, he cannot be loosed for the space of many years, for he hath no power over the people of, or over the hearts of the people, for they dwell in righteousness, and the Holy One of Israel reigneth. So the, um, in the student manual for this verse, how will Satan be bound? Nephi gave a very clear definition in scripture of how Satan is to be bound during the millennium. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote the following explanation concerning this important verse. What does it mean to bind Satan? How is he bound? Our revelation says, and in that day Satan shall not have power to tempt any man. Does this mean that power is withdrawn from Satan so that he can no longer entice men to do evil? Or does it mean that men no longer succumb to his enticements because their hearts are so set on righteousness that they refuse to forsake that which is good to follow him who is evil? Clearly, it means the latter. Satan was not bound in heaven in the very presence of God, in the sense that he was denied the right and power to preach false doctrine and to invite men to walk away from that God whose children they were. Nay, in this sense, he could not have been bound in heaven, for even he must have his agency. How then will Satan be bound during the millennium? It will be by the righteousness of the people. Um, and that reminded me of the Spencer W. Kimball quote, when Satan is bound in a single home, when Satan is bound in a single life, the millennium has already begun in that home, in that life. So I used to think, you know, of the, those two scenarios that Bruce R. McConkie said, I used to think it was the former. Um, but this teaches that this is just one more point of that rending the veil of unbelief. So it's true that Christ will conquer evil. He will bind the devil at the great and dreadful day. He will not tolerate a filthy kingdom. Wicked people will be destroyed, but it is up to us to bind him by not heeding temptations. This is how we get our stall. But I haven't quite fully answered my question yet from earlier. So I'm going to read a quote from Orson Pratt. It says, now then all the inhabitants who are spared from this fire those who are not proud and who do not do wickedly will be cleansed more fully and filled with the glory of God. A partial change will be wrought upon them, not a change to immortality like that which all the saints will undergo when they are changed in the twinkling of an eye from mortality to immortality. But so great will be the change then wrought that the children who are born into the world will grow up without sin unto salvation. Why will this be so? Because that fallen nature introduced by the fall and transferred from parents to children from generation to generation will be in a measure eradicated by this change. Then the righteous will go forth and grow up like calves of the stall. And one revelation says their children shall grow up without sin unto salvation. Satan having no power to tempt them, these children will not sin. The question may arise here, will it be possible for men to sin during the millennium? Yes. Why? because they have not lost their agency. Agency always continues wherever intelligent beings are, whether in heaven, on the earth, or among any of the creations that God has made. Wherever you find intelligent beings, there will you find an agency, not to the same extent perhaps under all circumstances, but yet there is always the exercise of agency where there is intelligence. 
For instance, when Satan is bound and a seal set upon him in the lowermost pit, his ag agency is partially destroyed in some things. He will not have power to come out of that pit. Now he has that power. Then he will then he will not have power to tempt the children of men. Now he has that power. Consequently, his agency then will be measurably destroyed or taken away, but not in full. The Lord will not destroy the agency of the people during the millennium. Therefore, there will be a possibility of their sinning during that time. But if they who live then do sin, it will not be because of the power of the devil to tempt them, for he will have no power over them. And they will sin merely because they choose to do so of their own free will. So doesn't that just make even more sense now why the Lord needs a people who have already chosen Jesus Christ over this fallen world for when he comes again? So we see there is still a test. It's not a free pass. People still can choose to sin, and they will still have to choose the Lord over the world. But the classroom will look a little different than it does right now. So once again, this is another principle we may have expected to be divine intervention solving our problems, but it turns out to be something we are expected to learn how to do here and now. We are not waiting for waiting on him. He's waiting on us. We can and must bind the devil so he has no power in our homes. Sorry, this is all my words now. <laughs> we can come together and bind him so he has no power in our communities. We can be the people President Nelson has called us to be, so we can become the people he has called us to be, so that the Lord may come again to his city that we build. Together, with our children, we can grow up or continue to grow as calves of the stall and kick the devil out of our Zion. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 So I had a few thoughts that came, especially, again, right at the end. Um, that Orson Pratt quote is really, really awesome. Um, the Lord will not destroy the agency of the people during the millennium. Therefore, they, it will be possible for their sinning. So my first thought was that we need to have faith obedience. Um, we look to the keys. We look to our king, um, Jesus Christ, who puts forth the law. And if we are willing to obey that law, then we're using our agency to do so. Nobody is forcing us. We're choosing to be obedient because we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The second thing is that in the millennium, it's not the end, right? it's not the end, right? It's just that 1000 period time before the celestialization of the world. And so we'll be living in a terrestrial world instead of a telestial world. So we'll still have that group of telestial people who are there. Um, terrestrial, and since we don't, are you, sorry. I'm sorry. Did you, are you saying terrestrial people? Yes. Terrestrial, not telestial. Sorry. Terrestrial. Sea turtle. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Thanks. Um, but, uh, this goes back to actually a quote that Jessica put on discord yesterday from second Nephi 10, wherefore my beloved brethren, reconcile yourselves to the will of God and not to the will of the devil and the flesh. And so I really loved that because, um, Nephi separated, actually, this is probably Isaiah. I think this is Isaiah chapters by now. Um, it, it's separating the devil and the flesh. And so it's separating satan from the natural man and so in the millennium that's what we'll be having to fight against is the natural man our natural tendencies and not god's tendencies and that's that's the opposition because we always have to have an opposition in all things it's a law right um and so that's where the the opposition comes in in, in the millennium situation circumstance so those were kind of my thoughts as, as you were going through that and how it just makes sense because the 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 gem of the plan of salvation was that everything is based on agents. Nobody is forced. That's why we went with God's plan and not with Satan's counterfeit, right? If he takes that away, then it's like, okay, well, what, I mean, what was even the point? <laughs> yeah, I, that goes really well with a couple of President Nelson quotes that came to mind for me. One is from October, 2022 his talk on overcoming the world. And he says, overcoming the world certainly does not mean becoming perfect in this life, nor does it mean that your problems will magically evaporate because they won't. <laughs> and it does not mean that you won't still make mistakes, but overcoming the world does mean that your resistance to sin will increase. Each time you do anything good, things that the natural man would not do, you are overcoming the world. 
So when you resist the natural man as you repent, right, um, your resistance to sin will increase, which goes into what you're talking about, Levi, right? That Satan is bound because we're we're resistant, sin resistant. And then he also has um one in the the everlasting covenant that's from the Liahona. I think it's the Liahona at this point, not Ensign. Anyway, October 2022 says those who keep their covenants with God will become a strain of sin resistant souls. Those who keep their covenants will have the strength to resist the constant influence of the world. So I thought those two went really well with, with everything you just talked about. Yeah, I like that. I like both Tracy, yours and Renee's um, thoughts compared with that. Like it, I was reading earlier in Moses chapter one, as I was preparing for fireside on Sunday, and I read that part about when Satan comes to Moses and it's and it scared him, you know, and he began to, to tremble greatly. And uh, so I was reading to the student manual and I had a few quotes that popped in my head as you were going through this. And I'll just share, this is just from the student manual, what the text says. It says, uh, when he felt afraid in Satan's present, presence, Moses saw the bitterness of hell. And being in constant rebellion towards God truly is a living hell. And that is the way that Satan wants us to live. Yet there is no need to fear if we are faithful, for we know the wisdom of God is greater than the cunning of the devil. And then it jumps to the example of Satan being tempted, or Satan tempting the Savior. And uh, this is a talk from President Spencer W. Kimball about resisting Satan's temptations, kind of along the lines of what Tracy and Renee just said too. But it, it said, um, one thing I liked here is when Satan was tempting the Savior, he said, this is President, uh, sorry, President Kimball. This, this is his words. He said, Christ did not so rationalize with the devil. He positively and promptly closed the discussion and commanded, get thee hence, Satan, meaning likely, get out of my sight, get out of my presence. I will not listen. I will have nothing to do with you. And then we reread re that the devil leaveth him. This is our proper pattern. If we would prevent sin rather than be faced with a much more difficult task of curing it. And now as I study the story, of the Redeemer and his temptations, I am certain he spent his energies fortifying himself against temptation rather than battling with it and having to conquer it. And so I, I like that beginning part of your insight too, Levi, where you're talking about calves growing up in the stalls and like having that thought process earlier on. It's like, well, why didn't they have to do that? You know, but, but the opportunity we have, if we put in the work and the time now learning how to overcome temptation, overcome sin, preparing just as the Savior did, fortifying himself because he knew Satan would eventually come knock him. You know, he didn't have to tremble like Moses did for a moment until he realized, you know, God is smarter than that. God is, you know, able to outwit anything the devil can throw in our path. If we're able to have that sort of mentality going into this battle that we have to fight every single day and struggle with, you know, we make it possible for our children to be raised like calves in the stall or future generations to have the access and ability to that to and also to teach them in love and righteousness and prepare them for those moments that they won't backslide or they won't be faced you know when they still have their agency and we're living during the millennium to not choose the ways of god because they're still gonna have their agency and i just i thought that was really cool the way you three tied those things together i really love that insight because that's something that's really been on my head especially as a parent or really i've been on my mind especially as a parent. such yeah. a really cool you know, I just had the thought too, that we, we have more power than we think we do right now to create that, the stall environment for our individual families. Um, because we don't have to let certain media into our house. We don't have to let the internet into our house. <laughs> we, we don't have to live in certain areas. It actually reminds me also of another recent fireside. I think it was a couple weeks ago. That Micah did on Revelation talking about like the locations where you live, right? It's like you you choose where you live and you choose what comes into your home, right? And so Zion, like when you talk about um everything that, that you just read, Levi, it's in the context of the millennium and the new Jerusalem, that the children will have this environment where they're, you know, we have fled from sin instead of like battling it every day. But how often do we do that in our individual lives right now? And where we're like battling against things that are around us or 
you know, media or things on the internet or whatever, trying to resist it versus just fleeing from it. Stop the subscription, move, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? (laughs) Like find, find a place and find a way to, to create that. And they were talking about that also in conference several years ago, a lot, creating a sanctuary of faith in your home. Right. Mm -hmm. And so how do we do that now? And then it will just get easier and easier because more and more of our neighbors will be doing it too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it'll be easier to stay spiritually motivated that way as well. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Yeah. I, I love I love those comments. Um the I mean part partly that's one of the reasons why I wanted to include that. Um Satan or the millennium can start in in somebody's home or or in their life right now. I mean, it doesn't have to wait for for anything. So I thought that went perfectly with what you're saying. And and Mason, I think that quote um, or story that should have been a part of my my insight. It went so perfectly with it that um, you know that's what we need to do exactly is you know, we're not going to have a conversation about this. <laughs> Just get out. And, uh, and I don't care what you have to say. I don't want to hear it. And, uh, and right now you're right. It is a battle every single day. Both the, we all said that, but um, the, but it also having that perspective, it puts more weight on, on those decisions. I feel like, you know, it's, it, it's always been on my mind to you know we should choose the right yes of course but when you think about this will affect not only my current level of spirituality but it's it's propping the door open a little bit for the devil to enter in and pushes it further down the road and makes it that much less likely for our children and um everybody else in that home or in the future community um, to have that stall protection and, um, you know, no pressure as a parent, right? But the, but having that kind of perspective makes it a, hopefully makes it a little bit easier choice to say, oh, you know, I have a responsibility and that has really big, a lot bigger consequences than the devil wants us to think it does. And um, so, yeah, that's really helpful. That's true. I love that at the very end when you said that he wants us to think the consequences are way bigger. Because that, man, that can sidetrack you so bad when you're so focused on like the negative aspect of when you stumble or when you do something wrong or whatever. And it just, it can consume your life. Well, he he does it on each end, right? He'll, like, he'll try to entice you to do something and say, it's not a big deal. It doesn't have impact. (laughs) And then the second you're done, it's like, oh, now you've blown it. <laughs> That's the end for you. <laughs> might as well just keep going. No, Trinity, might as well keep going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're done. How could you mess up? What's wrong yeah. with you? You didn't roll the car enough. Keep, keep rolling it down further into the ditch. <laughs> Cut the brakes. going to be an explosion. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody. Should we move on to Tracy? Sure, let's do it. Okay, Mosiah 26. Um, And it says, And now the spirit of Alma was again troubled, and he went and inquired of the Lord what he should do concerning this matter, for he feared that he should do wrong in the sight of God. And it came to pass that after he poured out his whole soul to God, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, Blessed art thou, Alma. Thou art blessed because of thy exceeding faith in the words alone of my servant Abinadi. And blessed art thou because thou hast established a church among this people, and they shall be established, and they shall be my people. And because thou hast inquired of me concerning the transgressor, thou art blessed. Thou art my servant, and I covenant with thee that thou shalt have eternal life, and thou shalt shalt serve me and go forth in my name, and shalt gather to gather together my sheep. Um, so I'm actually having some other insights from what um <laughs> Renee and, and Levi have already said that I didn't consider for this insight. So, but I came across this passage uh, and the wording from the Lord to Alma really caught my eye. He said, I covenant with thee that thou shalt have eternal life. And I thought Alma just recorded for us that he had his calling and election made sure. This is one of the doctrines of the church that is often neglected and de-emphasized because people would rather not dig into it 
what it actually takes to receive it. It's kind of like not praying for something because you know you probably won't like the answer that you will get. So in the New Testament, Peter taught the former day saints how they needed to be diligent in developing the attributes of Christ culminating in charity until they had their calling and election mature. In 2 Peter 1, it says, for if these things be in you and abound, no balance. So I, I really like that. So if these things, he's talking about the develop, developing these attributes, it says, um, and abound. So here we see that there's no balancing act. There's no proving of contraries here. You abound in charity. You abound in faith. You abound in mercy and justice and all of these things. There's no like taking from mercy to give more justice kind of thing. So I really liked that verbiage. Um, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our uh, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So upon the subject of having your calling and election made sure, Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, To have one's calling and election made sure is to be sealed up unto eternal life. It is to have the unconditional guarantee of exaltation in the highest heaven of the celestial world. It is to receive the assurance of Godhood. It is, in effect, to have the day of judgment advanced so that an inheritance of all the glory and honor of the Father's kingdom is assured prior to the day when the faithful actually enter into the divine presence to sit with Christ in his throne, even as he is set down with his father in his throne. Joseph Smith further taught, after a person has faith in Christ, repents of his sins, and is baptized for the remission of his sins, and receives the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands, which is the first comforter, then let him continue to humble himself before God, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, and living by every word of God. And the Lord will soon say unto him, Son, thou shalt be exalted, or daughter. When the Lord has thoroughly proved him, and finds that the man, or woman, is just dis- is determined to serve him at all hazards, then the man will find his calling and election made sure. So from these quotes, we learned that we need to go through trial and tribulation, aka all hazards, to prove to God that we will live by every word that proceeds from him, or in other words, be exactly obedient. But even that isn't enough. Peter then explains that they were eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ and heard the voice of the Father, but even that wasn't an adequate indicator. Peter continues, we have therefore a more sure knowledge of the word of prophecy, to which word of prophecy you do well, that you take heed as unto a light which shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but of holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Peter says he knew when he had his calling and election made sure when the Holy Ghost bore witness to him and sealed it upon him through the gift of prophecy. Joseph Smith teaches the Holy Ghost has no other effect than pure intelligence. It is more powerful in expanding the mind and heightening the understanding and storing the intellect with present knowledge of a man. We learn that having your calling and election made sure then is the manifestation from the Holy Ghost known as the Holy Spirit of promise. It is that pure knowledge that you will be a joint heir with Christ. You will dwell in the highest degree of the celestial kingdom. So as I considered the record from Alma, my thoughts continued to ask if there were other instances in the Book of Mormon where it was clear that a person had their calling and election made sure, and what were the circumstances that surrounded it? Was there a pattern that we could implement in our own lives to help us on this path of receiving the more sure word of prophecy by having our calling and election made sure? So my first example is Enos. It says, and my soul hungered, and I kneeled down before my maker, and I cried unto him in mighty prayer and supplication for my own soul, and all the day long did I cry unto him. Yea, and when the night came, I did still raise my voice high, that it reached the heavens, and there came a voice unto me, saying, Enos, thy sins are forgiven thee, and thou shalt be blessed. And he said unto me, because of thy faith in Christ, whom thou hast never before heard nor seen. Now it came to pass that when I had heard these words, I began to feel a desire for the welfare of my brother and the Nephites. Wherefore, I did pour out my whole soul unto God for them. And I prayed unto him with many long strugglings for my brother and the Lamanites. And now it came to pass that I, Enos, went about among the people of Nephi, prophesying of things to come and testifying of the things which I had heard and seen. And I saw that I must soon go down to my grave, having been wrought upon by the power of God, that I must preach and prophesy unto this people and declare the word according to the truth, which is in Christ. And I have declared it in all my days and have rejoiced in it above that of the world. And I soon go down to the place 
of my rest, which is with my Redeemer. For I know that in him I shall rest, and I rejoice in that day. When my mortal shall put on immortality and shall stand before them, him, then shall I see his face with pleasure, and he will say unto me, Come unto me, you blessed. There is a place prepared for you in the mansions of my Father. Amen. So this last scripture coincides so well with my insight from last week regarding participation trophies versus ranking with our Savior, you know, mansions in my Father kind of thing. Um, the next example is the 12 Nephite disciples. And it came to pass when Jesus had said, the, spake these words, said these words, he spake unto the disciples one by one, saying unto them, what is it that you desire of me after I am gone to the Father? And they all spake, save it were three, saying, we desire that after we lived, have lived unto the age of a man, that our ministry, wherein thou hast called us, may have an end, that we may speedily come unto thee in thy kingdom. And he said unto them, blessed are ye, because ye desire ye desired this thing of me. Therefore, after ye are seventy and two years old, ye shall come unto me in my kingdom, and with me ye shall find rest. And when he had spoken unto them, he turned himself unto the three and said unto them, What will ye that I should do unto you when I am gone unto the Father? And they sorrowed in their hearts, for they durst not speak unto him the thing which they desired. And he said unto them, Behold, I know your thoughts, and ye have desired the thing which John, my beloved, who was with me in my ministry before that I was lifted up by the Jews, desired of me. Therefore, more blessed are ye, for ye shall never taste death, but ye shall live to behold all the doings of the Father unto the children of men, even until all things shall be fulfilled according to the will of the Father, when I shall come in my glory with the powers of heaven. And ye shall never endure the pains of death, but when I shall come in my glory, ye shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye, from mortality to immortality, and then shall ye be blessed in the kingdom of my Father. And again, ye shall not have pain while ye shall dwell in the flesh, neither sorrow, save it be for the sins of the world. For ye have desired that ye might bring souls unto me, while well, the world shall stand. And for this cause, ye shall have fullness of joy, and ye shall sit down in the kingdom of my Father. Yea, your joy shall be full, even as the Father hath given me fullness of joy, and ye shall be even as I am. And I am even as the Father, and the Father and I are one. So my final example tonight is Moroni. In Ether 12, it says, And again, I remember that those that thou hast said, that thou hast loved the world, even unto the laying down of thy life for the world, that thou mightest take it again to prepare a place for the children of men. And now I know that this love which thou hast had for the children of men is charity. Wherefore, except men shall have charity, they cannot inherit the place, that place which thou hast prepared in the mansions of my father, of thy father. Wherefore, I know that by this thing which thou hast said, that if the Gentiles have not charity because of our weakness, that thou wilt prove them, and to take away their talent, yea, even that which they have received, and give it unto them who shall have more abundantly. And it came to pass that I prayed unto the Lord that he would give unto the Gentiles grace, and that they might have charity. And it came to pass that the Lord said unto me, If they have not charity, it mattereth not unto thee. Thou hast been faithful, wherefore thy garments are, shall be made clean. And because thou hast seen thy weakness, thou shalt be made strong, even unto the sitting down in the place which I have prepared in the mansions of my father. So as I went through all of these accounts, um, it's clear to me because I was highlighting, it's probably clear to the three compadres here because they can see the highlighting. But as you get into the document, um, it's pretty clear the pattern concerning those who received their calling and election and the things that we can do to, to, we can develop and do to receive ours as well. So number one is having faith in and knowledge of the Lord. And that comes through mostly the testimony of someone else. Number two, supplicate. Um, the savior for this promise, either through prayer or in person. Exhibit charity through praying for the welfare of others. Preach the word among the people, or in other words, be a watchman on the tower. And do what the Lord asks, or in other words, have exact obedience. Many of these concepts, I'm sure that this group is already familiar with. But what struck me was the point of praying for p other people to come to the knowledge, praying that they might receive the gifts of the spirit, etc., the other thing that I um, that I love through these examples is that receiving our calling and election really is attainable in this life. Marion G. Romney um, gave a talk that breaks all of this down as well uh, in October of 1965. And he said, the fullness of eternal life is not attainable in mortality, but the peace, which is its harbinger and which comes as a result of making one's calling and election sure is attainable in this life. The Lord has promised that he who doeth the works of righteousness shall receive his reward, even peace in this world and eternal life in the world to come. I know that the Book of Mormon is the word of God and was written for us in the latter days and gives us examples of attainable things in our life. 
I pray that you and I can be diligent and strive to make our callings and elections sure through following the above pattern set forth by prophets. And that ends my insight. That was so good, Tracy. That was really good. I love that last quote. Um, who was it? Mary, Mary Ann G. Romney. G. Romney. It really I harkens back to President Nelson. Yeah, I hadn't connected before that phrase, even peace in this world. Mm -hmm. Having peace in this world, connecting that to having your calling and election made sure and like that, that peace and, and knowledge and confidence being part of having peace in this world. That's awesome. Yeah. That there were a, a couple of other quotes that I could have added, but it would just, you know, as we <laughs> all know, these things just keep growing. They, they take on a life of their own. <laughs> oh. So many words. <laughs> yeah, there there was something I felt like I was reading. Maybe it was in conjunction with when I was studying my my own, but it was kind of along those same lines that um, when you achieve that knowledge that, or maybe it was because I was reading Joseph Smith, uh, teachings of Prophet Joseph Smith. Um, when you get that, then your mind is set at ease and no matter what comes against you, um, you don't have to fear. You don't have to worry because you know, you're standing with God and, and it just relieves that big burden. So yeah, I, I too really love that. Um, yeah, that was one of the quotes that I could have put in, but didn't. <laughs> Perfect. Um, <Maybe> I gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> another thing that I love that you put in there was your step number two: supplicate the savior for this promise. You know, you don't get things that you don't ask for. And this is something that I don't think people think to ask for. And like you said, it's not discussed very often and it's kind of neglected and people's eyes kind of glaze over if you start talking about it. But that's that's why it's so critical to talk about it, because you're not going to get it if you're not asking for it. And um, so that is something we all will need to do. Um, I did have a friend that I was talking about it with like a year ago or so in the and he was a fellow ordinance worker. And he said, you have to be really careful though, because if you start praying for that, you're going to get all those hazards that it talks about. You have to be proved on every hazard. So be prepared that if you do pray for it, that. Well, do you remember what I said at the very beginning of this? I said, it's kind of like not praying for something because you know, you probably won't like the answer that you're going to get. <laughs> exactly. 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 <laughs> Well, and it's interesting. I wasn't going to put the word supplicate. I was just going to put the word pray for or ask for something, but the supplicate came to mind and I had to look it up. So like, what does that exactly mean? And just, uh, you know, Googling it, it says ask for or beg for something earnestly or humbly. And I was like, oh man, that's perfect. Considering the, the subject matter. Well, look at the example you brought up of the three Levites. Yeah. Like, going off of what you said and Levi said, like they, that was something they really desired. And they're like, maybe a thought in their head was, if we ask for this, we, we're probably going to get it. And that's, you know, to to have the fact to know that you're going to live forever and not experience death could be super joyful and rewarding, but I'll, maybe a little bit intimidating at the same time. To be like, am I, can I really commit to this? Am well, what's interesting is that, I mean, Ooh. they all ask basically for their calling and election, right? If we go back to that example, because all 12 received their calling and election in, the, in this yeah. section, but only three of them were translated. So just because you have your calling and election made sure doesn't necessarily mean that you're translated. Oh, yeah. And I was talking about it in the way of supplicating the Savior, yeah. the promise. And so yeah. it just, but it, but it's like when you do that, when you supplicate to the Savior and ask in a more humble way, they didn't even have to speak it. And he still knew, yeah. like, oh, you guys were so humble and doing this out of such, I don't know if you would call it respect or whatever you want to call it towards the Savior that he granted them what was the desire. Reverence. Towards. Yeah, yeah, Reverend, thank, thank you, Reverend, perfect. But it's, um, this is such a really cool subject. And I remember going through this in the Joseph's Boys class. And every time we go through this class, my mind always goes back to, like, has anybody received it modernly, like in modern times? And I always go back to Joseph and Hiram Smith. I know there's a few others mentioned in the Doctrine and Covenants. Hebrew C. Kimball is one. Yeah. Um, actually, if you go through Marion Romney's talk, uh, he had several latter day examples as well. I just didn't, I wanted to pull from the Book of Mormon, so I didn't add those here. But um, yeah, look up that that talk <laughs> when you have time. 
<laughs> because it goes through a lot of really awesome other awesome examples. Yeah, that's cool. Because I like have Levi mentioned, like when you go through the teaching of the Prophet Joseph Smith and you see that calmness, you know, right to the last things he was saying, up to prior to both of their martyrdom of the Prophet and of Hiram Smith, like Joseph was calm. He knew it was coming. Hiram was optimistic right up to the last second, you know. And it was just, it was it's just those men had that assurance. You know, they had they had that that faith, that knowledge, they had that promise. They had their calling election feature. And it's, you know, there's still always, you know, that, that little bit of how is it going to go down? How am I going to die? Whatever that can be frightening, I would assume. But but it just knowing, like, if, when you read through that, up to that experience, it's like, wow. Like, you you feel saddened, but at the same time, you sense, like Levi said, you sense the calmness about them. And it's just such a cool feeling to know that that there is that power and that peace that Renee mentioned, and you also mentioned behind that. So I, I really love that last book, too, and the entire thing. It's, well worth going over multiple more times. So I was also connecting in my head. Um, we talk a lot just in Zion or Bust in general about praying for the redemption of Zion, right? Crying unto Lord day and night, asking for the redemption of Zion. Um, and I just connected that to this idea of praying for a calling election because we talk all, all the time also about how we have to become sanctified and how do we become sanctified by, it's basically the covenant path, right? Faith, repentance, baptism, all the way up through temple covenants, through calling an election made sure, right? Until you uh, get to that point where you can run the veil. So those two seem to go together really well. Like maybe that's something that we should consider adding to our personal prayers. Like when we pray for Zion to be redeemed, also pray for our personal calling, callings and elections. Well, because... going along the lines of that is like, you don't get into Zion until you're like in a celestial state. Right. And, and that's where calling election, make sure you, you have that assurance that you're going to, to live in the celestial kingdom. And so that's what Zion eventually is going to, to be. And so I think that makes perfect sense to pray for both of those in conjunction because they're inseparably connected. Yeah. Yeah, and Church of the Firstborn is also connected to that. Yep. Right? Entering into that order. Um, man, I'm loving this discussion right now. <laughs> I <laughs> don't know if anyone has anything else they want to say about prayer specifically. Well, Do you want to go ahead? Oh, did you? Unless you had more to say, all. I had other thoughts, but I don't want to move on. If that might okay. segue into something, but you keep going. Okay. <laughs> So another thought that I had was it was really standing out to me um, when you were going through those examples, Tracy, of you know the, the patterns and the examples from the Book of Mormon, how they were all outwardly focused. Mm -hmm. Right, that Enos is was, what really caught my eye as well. Yeah, Enos was praying for for other people, and the the you know twelve disciples were bringing people under Christ missionary work was mentioned cherry was mentioned right in ether um and that's something that's kind of already been on my mind a little bit thinking about how in the gospel progression we naturally get to a point where like like it naturally turns outward okay so if you so you think of it in terms of the covenant of covenants right and how the covenants are set up and how the general path is set up it starts with the individual, right? So like when you get baptized for yourself, that's an individual thing, <laughs> right? It's like you and Christ and, and it's a preparation to, to cleanse you, right? So now, now you're getting to repentance, you're getting into the gift of the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost can sanctify you, right? So you have like these individual things and then it starts to branch out when you start uh, getting the ordinance of the temple right? You start to get family involved, family connections, where it's now not just you, it's you and your spouse and you and your family and your children. Um, and then when we get into, uh, you know, and then, and then missionary work, right? is also a big thing. Being a watchman's a big thing. Are we 
right? So there's this sort of <laughs> natural progression from the self and cleansing the inner vessel to looking outward. And so that's something that I think we shall be, uh, you know, take some time to like self-evaluate. Like, am I, am I reaching out to people in, in whatever way the spirit prompts you to do that, you know, like do, do your ministering, doing your calling, reaching out to your neighbors, finding opportunities here on Zion or Bust, finding opportunities in your community, in your family, whatever, right? Like there's obviously tons of ways that you can do that, but the gospel naturally um, leads us into that state of looking outward and that that seems like a condition and a pattern of people who've had their callings and elections made sure. Well, that it's interesting that point of charity. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting it. that you say that because something that Micah posted just today was um, focusing on on like getting ourselves up to par and with the understanding that we need, and then branching out to others. You don't branch out to others first because you have to gain that knowledge to be able to share that knowledge. And then right. again, going off of what Peter was teaching, um, for these things be in you. He's talking about the the attributes of Christ and abound. Or I think about, you know, the cup overflowing, we usually have that analogy with the cup overflowing in iniquity. But I think, you know, our, our personal spiritual cups need to be overflowing with the spiritual gifts because spiritual gifts aren't meant for us. They're meant for us to develop for other people. It's just like the priesthood. The priesthood's yeah. not meant for selfish you know reasons. It's meant to bless other people, to bring other people in. Um, and so as we're abounding in those things, um, or as we're, we're growing those things in ourselves and then they start to abound, that's when you start reaching out to other people and being able to help them because you can pull them up to your level, Mm -hmm. but you can't, you can't do that unless you're at a higher level. You can only boost them so far. (laughs) (laughs) That's like, um, um, from my insight last week with the full purpose of heart, you know, the prophet Nephi taught that you can, you can only teach and testify so much and then let the spirit do the work. But if someone's heart isn't able and ready to receive it, you know, there's only so much you can do with that too. There's only so much that the spirit can do too. If other hearts aren't able to be ready to be filled. Um, but one other thing I was going to bring up too, is as Renee was talking, um, I really love that you, reference second peter as well because i was read actually reading in the student manual on that earlier and, and i found a quote from bruce mcconkey so i'll just read through just a little bit of it quick but he said that um, um relating this back to charity and the mind and knowing the mind of god he said it's one thing to know about god and another to know him uh, when we know him when we learn that he is a personal being and who is created in whose image is image of man is created when we learn that the son is the express image of his father's person when we learn that both the father and the son possess certain specified attributes and powers but we know them and in the sense of gaining eternal life when we enjoy and experience the same things they do and to know god is to think what he thinks to feel what he feels and to have the power that he possesses to comprehend the truth that he understands and to do what he does and those who know god become like him and have this kind of life which is life which is eternal life and so i really like that concept of that with also with charity, with being a watchman, with ministering and caring for others and praying for others. You know, it's, the, it's the same thing that God wants. He wants success, happiness, joy, eternal life for everybody. And that's our focus too, is the same focus as his. You know, that we, we become more like him. You know, we start to become those principles of revelation unto ourselves. And then we're able to, you know, conquer more of these hazards that come with making your call and election made sure. Anyways, I was going down the rabbit hole of this crazy, really good thread. I think it was you that started, Tracy, knowing the mind of God and how the principle of charity just kept coming up over and over again in that thread. And it was really cool because I found that uh, quote from Elder McConkey related into Second Peter. And I love that you had that insight too. So that's pretty cool. And caring for the poor and needy. I felt like yeah. I was missing one. That was it. There you go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> No poor among us. That's another thing that's been on my mind. And maybe this is a slight tangent, but maybe not. I was thinking, you know, we talk and focus and want and pray for 
Zion so much, but really, you know, and, and it's for us and our family, you know, we want to be there. We want our families to be there, but like, it's also the place of safety for like the entire country and the entire world. Right. And so I'm like, once Zion is established, we're like, hopefully taking in refugees all the time. Yeah. Right. Like that's, that's the goal. Like we want, it's just interesting because that reminds in. me of a few conferences ago when they were heavily emphasizing Mm -hmm. There was that one English guy, uh, I don't remember his name, but he was, had an English accent and yeah, that's what his whole talk was on. I should go back and review that one. Yeah. But like, hopefully we don't, you know, we're not going to get there and be like, great, we made it. <laughs> you know, it's like, we're sending out. <laughs> well, and it's like what Micah and Adam in particular says, you know, once I get in. there, I want to go back out. Yeah. Like, I'll get there, get my family situated. And then I want to go back out to the craziness to bring more people in. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's going to be a warfare against Zion, you know, and people aren't going to know how to defend themselves against it. They're going to be, oh, they're going to need resources. Yeah. And that's going to be the only safe place where that people are able to collect themselves, prepare for that. And it's just like the savior back in Levi's thoughts, how he prepared, he knew temptations were coming and he prepared. And then he was able to be like, man, See you later. Not even dealing with this. You know. and, yeah. And to Renee's point, um, when we did the the fireside where Brigham Young gave different advice to a whole bunch of different places. Um oh, yeah. when when I did the Ogden one, it was, you know, there are people who have never planted a thing in their lives, and we're going to need to support them as they learn how to do it. And so yeah, just like you're saying, there'll be people coming that are refugees. They don't have anything. They probably don't have the skills to be self-sufficient. Um, and so we're going to need to provide for them until they can get on their own two feet. And that makes so much sense when you think about the type of people that are required to establish this, the seed of Zion. It's going to be people who have charity. It's going to be people who want to help who can take in these people and help them get on their feet so that they can help people and bring, you know, just have this chain reaction. And like that wouldn't work if Zion wasn't started by people who have charity, who are praying for others and trying to bring others to Christ and wanting that and desiring it and making their callings and elections. Sure. But that's, yeah, that's like the character of those people there's required for the whole thing to work. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Awesome. Well, that was really neat. <laughs> nice. Such a discussion, you guys. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, I like that. We can just skip mine and keep going. No. <laughs> we have plenty of time <laughs> for both things. <laughs> Well, give me another 20 minutes. <laughs> I guess I can jump into mine then. Yeah, go for it. Well, this is cool because all these discussions have really, really tie in quite nicely, I think, to mine. So, surprise, surprise. Oh, yeah. I love that. I, I get excited for this because I know what's going to happen with each and every week. Um, so, I've been studying, well, oh man, I've been studying so much stuff lately. I got to figure this out. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about general conference coming up and I've been kind of thinking about the last six months of what I've been preparing for and what I've been studying. And so I kind of was praying a bit and trying to figure out where to, to keep my head up for, for, sorry, for preparing for general conference. And then interestingly enough, Tracy starts another thread about, you know, our pre pre conference thoughts. And so it got me thinking back on the challenge that President Nelson left to study Third Nephi, which I hit really hard in by the first couple months after conference and then started going into some other insights. And I wanted to go back into it a little bit, but it led me, this study led me into the book of Helaman. And so that's what my insight is going to be. But these are some lessons I'm seeing today that we can apply from what Mormon saw specifically to leave in the book of Helaman for to get into our hands now. So the book of Helaman shows us how we can judge between the fruits of good and evil. We learn of the results that evil produces when it takes hold upon societies and individuals. Now, having prophetically witnessed our day, 
Mormon understood the importance of the need for the Book of Helaman to reach our hands. And when he knew that we must learn how to put the world aside, uh, that we need to learn how to quit disobeying the Lord and his prophet, and we need to receive a sanctification of our hearts and our minds through the power and the atonement of Jesus Christ. So starting in Helaman chapter 1, verse 1, it says, And now it came to pass that in the commencement, commencement of the 40th year of the reign of the judges over the people of Nephi, there began to be a serious difficulty among the, among the people of the Nephites. So what difficulties were they facing at this time? The same exact difficulties that we are seeing amongst our society today. Political and civil disputes um, had split their society in half. Some saw their leaders as being unfit to lead, so instead of going about ways the correct way as inspired by their God-fearing leaders, the opposing side decided it was time to push through their agendas using chaos, dishonesty, priestcraft, murder, and all manner of secret and dark, uh, secret and dark acts. These dark acts gave rise to one of the most wicked groups in the Book of Mormon, the Gadianton robbers, and they were powered by Satan himself, and contention fueled their dark, word, uh, dark works. So we can see here, obviously, that contention is destructive. Now, this is a quote from President Nelson uh, from, his, from last conference called uh, Peacemakers Need It. Then he said, the sins of cor uh, corruption, dishonesties, oh, sorry, this is from Elder Worthland. I'm going to get to President Nelson in a second. So Elder Worthland says, the sins of corruption, dishonesty, strife, contention, and other evils in this world are not here by chance. They are evidence of the re relentless campaign of Satan and those who follow it. He uses every tool and device available to him to deceive, confuse, and mislead. That's a close quote from Elder Worthland. Now, this is the quote from President Nelson. Make no mistake about it, contention is evil. Jesus Christ declared that those who have the spirit of contention are not of him, but are of the devil. Who is the father of contention, and the devil stirreth up the hearts of men to contend with anger one with another. No man can serve two masters. We cannot support Satan with our verbal assaults and then think that we can still serve God. So moving on to my second point, we can see through these quotes that evil and secret works can destroy society. Uh, Elder Russell and Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained that the threat of secret combinations still exists in our day, and that the Book of Mormon teaches that the secret combinations engaged in crime present a serious challenge, not just to individuals and families, but to entire civilization. The secret combinations of our day function much like the Gideon robbers of the Book of Mormon times, and if we're not careful, today's secret combinations can overpower, or sorry, can obtain power and influence just as quickly and just as completely as they did in the Book of Mormon times. But do we remember this pattern? The secret combinations began among the more wicked of the society, but eventually seduced the more part of the righteous until the whole society was deluded. The Book of Mormon teaches that the devil is the author of all sin and the founder of these secret combinations. He uses secret combinations from generation to generation, according as he gets a hold upon the hearts of the children of men. And his purpose is to destroy individuals, families, communities, and nations. To a degree, he was successful during Book of Mormon time, and he is having far too much success today. And that was given back in 1997. So through this quote, <clears throat> we can see which leads into my next point, that unrighteous power and unrighteous influence can lead to pride and rebellion. So Mormon was careful to point out that pride was not part of the Lord's church, but because of great riches, it began to enter into the hearts of some of the members of the church. In his 1989 conference talk, Beware of Pride, President Benson, having understood how pride leads to the downfall of nations, taught us the following. To quote President Benson, he said, the Doctrine and Covenants tells us that the Book of Mormon is the record of the fallen people. And why did they fall? This is one of the major messages of the Book of Mormon, and Mormon gives the answer. Behold, the pride of this nation, or the people of the Nephites, have proven their destruction. And then, lest we miss that momentous Book of Mormon message from that fallen people, the Lord warns us in the Doctrine and Covenants, beware of pride, lest you become, the Nephi uh, lest you become as the Nephites of old. Pride is a very misunderstood sin, and many are sitting in ignorance. In the scriptures, there is no such thing as righteous pride. It is always considered a sin. Therefore, no matter how the world uses the term, we must understand how God uses the term, so we can understand the language and the holy writ and prophets of God. Most of us think of pride as self-centeredness, conceit, boastfulness, arrogance, and haut haughtiness. But of all these elements, all of these are elements of the sin, but at the heart, the core is still missing. The central feature of pride is enmity. Enmity toward God and enmity toward our fellow men. Enmity means hatred, hostility to, or a state of opposition. It is the power by which Satan wishes to reign over us. We pit our wills against God, and when we direct our pride toward God, it is the spirit of my will and not thine be done. As Paul said, they seek their own, not the things of which are Jesus Christ's. Our will in competition to God's will allow desires, appetites, and passions to go unbridled. The proud cannot accept the authority of God 
giving direction in their lives. Our enmity toward God takes on many labels, such as rebellion, hard-heartedness, stiff-neckedness, unrepentant, puffed up, easily offended, and sign seekers. The crowd wish God would agree with them, and they aren't interested in changing their opinions to agree with God. Well, that's a close quote from President Benson. Goes back to my words. <clears throat> so our society today is guilty of this, and we are becoming ripe for destruction. And yet there is still hope for those who have the eyes to, to the eyes to see and the ears to hear what is truly happening. If we can take focus away from worldly distractions and put God first in our lives, He will show us the way to safety and salvation, just as He did to those who were able to do the same in the Book of Mormon. So from the Book of Helaman, I was able to learn a couple of things to help us combat against this and to warn us against it. So first off, we can turn to the scriptures. And in Helaman chapter 3, verse 29, it says, Yea, we see that whatsoever will may lay hold upon the word, whosoever will lay hold upon the word of God, which is quick and powerful, which shall divide asunder all the cunning and the snares and the wiles of the devil, and lead the man of Christ in a straight and narrow course across the everlasting gulf of misery, which is prepared to engulf the wicked. But President Ezra Taft Benson also taught that certain blessings come only through diligent scripture study. To quote him, he said, success in righteousness, the power to avoid deception, deception and resist temptation, guidance in our daily lives, healing of the soul, these are but of a few promises that the Lord has given to those who will come into his work. So what is something that the scriptures teach us today to combat pride, wickedness, and free spread? So this is the second point. Charity is the antidote to contention and pride. President Nelson recently taught that charity is the antidote to contention. Charity is the spiritual gift that helps us cast off the natural man who is selfish, Defensive, prideful, and jealous. Charity is the principal char characteristic of the true follower of Jesus Christ. Those blessed with the spiritual gift are long suffering, kind, they do not envy others, and are not caught up in their own importance. Brothers and sisters, the pure love of Christ is the answer to contention that ails us today. Charity propels us to bear, another, bear one another's burdens rather than keep burdens upon each other. The pure love of Christ allows us to stand as witnesses of God at all times and in all things, especially in tense situations. Let's close quote from President Nelson. So to stay the wrath and judgments that come from wickedness, sin, and evil, we must be willing to turn away from it and never return unto it. Our hearts must be focused upon the Savior. When we truly apply the atonement in our lives and seek to do and become better, we are filled with the pure love of Christ and our God. We seek to put God first and see our brothers and sisters as we see ourselves, as children of our Heavenly Father, and as joint heirs with our Savior. We all want to take part in and receive those same promised blessings that are found within our covenant. As our living prophet taught us, the pure love of Christ allows us to stand as witnesses of God at all times and all things. We become proclaimers of truth, watchmen upon the tower, voices of warning and repentance, in the hopes that many will turn away from their worldly aspirations of gain, priestcraft, selfishness, and sin. And we invite all to come unto Christ that we may unite in the great Latter-day work of our God. And the third thing is that we seek to build up Zion about ourselves. So the spirit of true charity and unity naturally naturally leads the faithful to building up the kingdom of God as their focus. Unselfish labors are towards spreading the message of the restored gospel to all who will listen. Now jumping backwards to 2 Nephi 26, verses 29 through 31, it says, He commanded that there should be no priestcrafts, for the old priestcrafts are that men shall preach and set themselves up as a light unto the world, that they may get the gain and praise of the world, but they seek not the welfare of Zion. Behold, the Lord hath forbidden this thing. Wherefore, the Lord God hath given a commandment that all men should have charity which charity is love, and except they should have charity, they would not. Wherefore, if they should not have charity, wherefore, if they should have charity, they would not suffer the labor in Zion to perish. But the labor in Zion shall labor for Zion, for if they labor for money, they shall perish. A pro prophet Mormon included the book of Helaman, knowing that we would be in for some excruciating trials. And I had my plea alongside his to put aside all these foolish things and replace it with a burning desire and a dog-like persistence for the labor for Zion the new Jerusalem, the actual prophesied city of our Savior, Jesus Christ, for that temple to finally be built in the center stake of Zion in Jackson County, Missouri. Within that desire, we will find the promised power that comes with righteousness. That power is as real and true today as it was almost 200 years ago. Do not lose sight of it, for the time is soon coming when it will be our only place of safety. Quote President Brigham Young, he said, California is not the gathering place for the saints. Here is the gathering place. He's referring to Salt Lake City. And here we will gather and stay until God says, go somewhere else. And this is back to Jackson County. Do not be scared. For as the Lord lives, this people will go back and build a great temple there. For this people will surely go back to Jackson County. And to quote um, from President Nelson, this is a talk that Micah actually posted. 
and had just grown back when he was a Sunday school president in 1974. And so he said, our duty is to raise up a generation of men and women worthy to receive the coming of the Lord, for he will come to Jackson County, Missouri, to be sustained as King of Kings, and he will come also to Israel to be hailed as the Lord of Lords. This his millennial reign, uh, then his millennial reign will be ushered. And President Joseph Fielding Smith taught that the center place where the city, or the center place where the city of New Jerusalem is to be built is in Jackson County, Missouri. It never was the intention to substitute Utah or any other place for Jackson County. And now to quote the prophet Joseph Smith in closing, he said, we ought to have Zion, we ought to have the building up of Zion as our greatest object. When wars come, we shall have to flee to Zion. The cry is to make haste. The revelations say you shall not have time to have gone over the earth until these things come. The time is soon coming when no man will have any peace put in Zion under states. These things are at our doors. Let's hear that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. It really coincided with both, I mean, with everybody's. Um, I like the, the three points that you pull out from Helaman, um, but then the three contrary points, like the opposite of, of that and how they coincide really well. Um, and then number two, number three, you know, charity is the entity we just ended on, you know, discussing charity from my insight on, you know, having our calling and election made sure and, and how Renee pulled that in, how it goes outward and, and charity is always outward. It's never inward. Um, and then seeking to build it up Zion and not ourselves. Um, the, the line that caught my eye was not caught up in their own importance, um, which is part of witchcraft light, right? You know, um, becoming that light unto people that people go to. Um, and then you think that it, it's all you, that it's, it's not coming from the spirit. And you don't give the glory back to God. You're instead saying, oh, these are my insights and, you know, whatever. Um, but we all know that it all comes from the spirit. It all comes from God because it's his truth. And we need to always turn that back to God as we help other people. Double amen. One of the things that... Uh... I was thinking of was, you know, I, I know this was kind of already evident, but when we, when you were talking about pride, um, you know, people get to the point, I mean, you said leads to pride and rebellion. People get to the point where just because God commands it, they feel like they have to do the opposite because <laughs> like, no, I'm my own person. I'm going to do things my way. And it's like, you're not doing things your way. You're doing things the devil's way. <laughs> you're really <laughs> following the one or the other, right? And just just to defy God, you're and to prove your own person, you end up following somebody else that's doesn't teach truth. But um, yeah, and I also I I completely agree with the charity one, and and I feel like we've talked about that a bit already. Um, but I I really loved the turn to the scriptures one, um, and how. President Benson said there are certain blessings that only come through diligent scripture study, not, not reading <laughs> diligent mm -hmm. scripture study. And, you know, this is one of those primary answers that seems like it's so simple. And yet I think for a lot of my life, and I'm assuming from my experience that many other church members are the same, that it you know, we, we only get the surface because we only scratch the surface as we're reading. And, uh, you know, there's so much power in knowing the doctrine, finding these connections, finding what things really mean. And not just, not just, it's a good story. The, the story is good, but if, if that's as far as you get and you don't find the doctrine and the other stuff, then you don't get those other blessings of that power to avoid this deception and resist temptation and and the healing of the soul um that the you know the more ever since we've started this i already love the book of mormon but doing these book of mormon or bust has really increased all of those things for me um mm -hmm. yeah yeah me too and then, of course, focusing on Zion, not ourselves, that that kind of goes along with the pride and the charity, I feel like is, you know, 
we we don't need to aggrandize ourselves we don't need to worry about um am i important enough <laughs> you know as we we hopefully are learning that we are already worth it and we're working on being worthy but um we don't have to be the main star <laughs> we can let christ have that role in our lives and in the the history of the world we don't have to be the standout so yeah. thank you for those awesome points mason thank you I love that. Yeah, like this was very powerful and meaningful to me, but none of my thoughts are like fully forming to speak them. <laughs> but but no, it was really good, and I feel like all of these concepts are so important. Um, and well, and I guess I guess some of what I'm thinking. Is that a lot of the a lot of these things? So so I'm looking back over where you're talking about pride, the like contention and pride, and not uh, they do not envy others or not cut up in their own importance. I'm like the, these things tend to manifest in very small moments in our lives, right? It's like somebody will do something like, oh, I can't believe that person said that, or you know. <laughs> Like, oh, that was so rude, you know, or whatever, right? And so it's usually not these big things where we're so offended and it's a big deal, you know, it's usually like these little, little things, but like, those are, those are the moments that we need to watch, right? And just be like, you know what? It, I... <laughs> what what can we do to make their day better what can we do to make each other's day better you know <laughs> and just develop those small habits of just just having the habit having the habit of thinking of other people and how can I help other people and how can I not be offended even by you know little things and yeah. to be able to say, I might be right, but I can let it go. And I don't have yeah. to make them say that I'm right. And right. I can just let it go and move on with my day. And hopefully in a way that helps them. Yeah, I, love, I like that. Yeah. And sometimes we want to feel validated, right? We want to hear somebody else say, oh, yeah, you know, I can't believe they did that. You're good. You know, <laughs> we tend to want that. <laughs> just be like it does it doesn't matter you know it doesn't matter just move on have charity not be puffed up not be focused on yourself or how you feel or how you think others perceive you or you know just anyway that's all well it kind of goes back to like you know if if you're on a good terms with god then Nobody else's opinion matters. Yeah. Um, and if you know you're on good terms with God, then you can see others in a light that you want them to also get to be on good terms with God, even though that's that's hard, but you you try to teach them the best way that you can. And that's why I think Enos's example really stood out to me too, because I mean he starts with himself, right? You know, he's praying, he wants the remission for his own sins. Um, and then he goes to his kindred, the Nephites, because he's a Nephite. And he's like, please help my brother, right? And then after he gets an assurance from the Lord regarding his brethren, I didn't do those verses, um, but I mean, because you can go read those yourself, but um, it says, I prayed into him with many long strugglings for my brother and the Lamanites. And I'm wondering if that's not only, you know, I want the Lamanites to, to be okay, but it, maybe it was, I want me to be okay with the Lamanites. You know, I want, you know, I want that charity to feel good about like, these are my brethren because they're fighting, right? They're, they're shedding each other's blood and, and they're close related. This is not too far from Nephi. I think isn't Enos Jacob's son. So it, it's not too far removed here. Um, and these are, these are the family. What do they call it? Family conflict. It's not family conflict, family feuds. <laughs> so, um, 
I love that, that, you know, he's, he's doing the closest brethren and then it's, you know, the Lamanites, the people who are his technically his enemies and how that we, that's a good progression for a good example for us to have that same progression. And sometimes all we can do is pray because the other people person or people's heart are so hard that there's no way that we can infiltrate that has to come from themselves and it has to come from the spirit. And until that comes, they're never going to be receptive. And so we need to pray that they can have their hearts softened because that's the only way that it's going to, that that charity is going to have an effect on them. It'll have a greater effect on us than it will on on them as we could develop that. That's hundred percent true. I've seen that, you know, and it's, it's, uh, oh man, like it's, it's a really humbling feeling and it's also really faith building, oh, I'm trying to think how to say this, but like having the ability, ability to express charity towards someone where there was hostile feelings towards someone where you feel like they've been so closed off that it's like, I don't know if this relationship's repairable. Like there's so much damage done but when you, when you're able to put your own selfish, call it fears or desires aside where you're, where you're like, this just, this has to be fixed. This is what the savior would like us to do. And I, I just, I don't know if it's going to be fixed, but you, you go in there and you express some sort of act of charity towards that individual. And then you instantly see the, you know, the dynamic change and the, the relationship starts to shift. And though you come out of it feeling way better about the situation and you know that that person might have been affected slightly, then over time, you know, hearts become soft and, you know, they're not so hard anymore and they become receptive to it, to it even more. And then relationships begin to heal and they start to get repaired. And it's like President Nelson said, you shouldn't be bringing in these situations into our lives where we're walking around hate shows with people mm-hmm. you know, having these contentious feelings. And it, like, it's, just, it's too hard to understand and to apply charity in your life when you have always feel like that. You know, those feelings have to be done away and charity combats that. And it, like President Nelson said, it's the antidote to it and, and understanding what charity really is. You know, everybody says, like, I, I'm pretty sure you said it, Tracy, in your last, from your book, Mormon or Bust, from this book, the very first one, and you did knowing the mind of God <clears throat> and having charity is knowing the mind of God. It's more than just saying, oh, it's just the love of Jesus Christ. Well, what mm-hmm. is that? It's understanding God. It's, under, it's becoming his will, following his will, letting him guide you to repair those contentious relationships, letting you pray, guiding you to pray for those people. That want to bring you harm, you know, or you think might want to bring you harm, but really they don't. They just are mad. <laughs> you know, it's just it's looking to seek after those things and not being afraid to do that. I shouldn't say afraid, but having the faith to, to do what we need. Yeah, I'm also thinking of of the Savior's example, and then also things that he told um, the men that were going out on missions in the Doctrine and Covenants where um sorry it's late my brain is it's shutting down um where he wouldn't like force himself (laughs) right into relationships or like into a situation where people didn't want him there right like he would he would extend the invitation that that's my thought is that the the savior is always extending the invitation and is always happy when people come, right? And so he's like, the invitation's there. Mm -hmm. I want a relationship with you. And I am going to be so happy if and when you accept the invitation, right? And a lot of people don't, (laughs) right? Or or didn't, didn't, or still don't. And they're like, you know, we're not interested or we don't like you or whatever, right? And so I I think about like, how, how do you apply that in in our own lives right now, you know, when we're talking about the, the peacemaking and the, the letting go of pride and the having charity that we can, to, you know, to these people in our lives, family, neighbors, you know, people in your war, whatever, that you, that you always had the invitation, right? It's like, you know what, you, whether they've been rude, whether they've been mean, whether they've whether there's been a misunderstanding or there's bad feelings for whatever reason, um, being able 
to be in that place personally where you're like, I still want to have a relationship with this person and the invitation's there. And if they were to mutually desire a relationship, I would be thrilled. I would be so happy, right? And so it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to like push on people, (laughs) you know, that are like, I don't really want (laughs) to, you know? But, but the invitation is there regardless of what they've done, that if they do decide that they want to, you know, come back and engage and have a relationship in the future, that you're happy about that. I think the same thing with, with Zion, the same thing with the celestial kingdom, right? Like, we have to be in a place where if somebody has truly hurt us or truly offended us or, you know, any of those things that if we were to see them walk through those doors or walk through that gate, we would be so happy that they're there, right? Like, I am so happy you're here with me. I'm so happy you're going to be my neighbor. (laughs) I'm so happy you worked it out with the savior, you know, and, and just be happy to see them. And I think that's a huge part of charity and this point, um, about pride and letting go of pride and not worrying about yourself and just really loving that person and wanting them to be successful and wanting them to realize their privileges and blessings, right? All of that stuff. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I like that. Oh, I kept Is that you? Sorry. Oh, Levi. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Rich, that that was that Levi's was daughter. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I, I thought maybe if I brought her out, your it would clear your head, Renee. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it takes a minute to get started. All else fails, just show a baby. The charity horrible. <laughs> so i just want to share in the chat danny um andrew um danny had a really good thought that she had this week coming from um come follow me but coinciding with the book of mormon um oops i didn't go up high enough So she says, come follow me this week from 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. And so she coincided that with Alma 32, 21, where it says, and now, as I said, concerning faith, faith is not to have a perfect knowledge of things. Therefore, if ye have faith, ye hope for things which are not seen, which are true. We do not need to have a perfect knowledge of every single detail of how the last days will play out, how Zion will be redeemed. We need to have a perfect faith that the Lord's word will be fulfilled literally. We look to the revelations we already have and look forward with faith to what is to come. So I just thought that was a really good insight that I'd share. That was really good. Thank you. Yeah, that's cool. It reminds me of um, my, like one of my new favorite scriptures in the last two months, Jerem 111. You know, having faith in those things that haven't happened yet, but are coming. <clears throat> you know, just to be in a like Trace mentioned, that Enos prayed and had that faith to be redeemed, redeemed from his sins. And that his son, Jeremiah, was also able to receive the same thing and the people around him because they learned that one great lesson. And that's like we, we understand and know the Book of Mormon warns us about our day, that it is our blueprint for Zion, but is also our master teacher to bring us to Jesus Christ, to, to enable and enact that faith, to help us really understand what it is. To place our faith to trust in Jesus Christ, then all of the things will come. You know what's also interesting is that when we, so I'm I'm reading her thought again, when we think of um, faith being a hope for things which are not seen, which are true, Mm -hmm. I would assume the default assumption for most people and, and for me too, is that you think of like invisible things or things that aren't in your field of vision, right? So like I have faith that God exists, even though I don't currently see him, Mm -hmm. but he currently exists somewhere. Right. 
But another way to think about that, which, which Danny is kind of pointing out here, when she's talking about how Zion will be redeemed and having perfect faith that the Lord's word will be fulfilled literally, is that things which are not seen could also refer to future things. Mm-hmm. It's not seen because it doesn't currently exist, but it is true because God has declared it will exist. Yeah. Right. And so we have faith in things that are behind the veil or, or that we can't currently see. And we also have faith in things that we don't, that we can't see yet because they are. They, they haven't have come to pass yet. In that future. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Danny. All right, I think uh, that ends our night. And Renee has the outro. Oh, yes, I knew that. (laughs) All right, brothers and sisters, thank you for joining us. We love you. We love the Book of Mormon. And we really do love getting together um, to discuss our insights with you. And we invite you to immerse yourself in the Book of Mormon this week and join us next week to share and discuss what you've learned. May we no longer treat lightly this great and marvelous gift the Lord has given to us. We know that the Book of Mormon truly is the word of God. It is written for our day. And through it, we will find the power to become a righteous people who are ready, able, and worthy to receive the Lord when he comes again as President Nelson has called upon us to become. The Lord loves you. We love you. And we will see you next week. Bye.